10. ZIL-E-167 The ZIL-E-167 is a Soviet off-road military vehicle that was designed and built during the early 1960s to withstand the challenging conditions in Siberia, the Ural Mountains, and the USSR's far eastern and northern regions. It had six wheels and was powered by not one, but two V8 engines. Both engines were located at the rear of the vehicle. To improve sliding in the snow, the bottom of the vehicle was protected with metal sheets. The vehicle was also capable of crossing water and controlling its tire pressure. It was equipped with air cleaning systems as well as a 4.5 kilowatt electric engine to pump water in case of any fires. It also had radio transmission capabilities. It was a model based on the four-axle army chassis ZIL-135L. There were plans for it to enter mass production, but due to its transmission being too complex, this never happened. 9. FDR's Train Beneath the Grand Central Terminal, located in New York City, sits a 1930s-era train station that holds one simple track, named Track 61. Track 61 was rumored to be built during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's presidency so he could travel to and from New York City in peace and out of the public eye. Originally from the city, he enjoyed visiting fairly often, but secretly suffered from polio, which wasn't very accepted at the time and resulted in having a stigma. It was believed that he had a specially designed train car that had enough space to hold his bulletproof limo. When the train arrived in New York City, the limo was able to drive right off the train and go to the next destination, which was usually the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. In 1945, after FDR's death, Track 61 was no longer used. The car used for transporting FDR stayed on the track, slowly rusting away as time passed. Nowadays, it belongs to the Danbury Railway Museum, located in Connecticut. Recently, experts have reported that the car didn't belong to FDR at all. It was quite simply known as a baggage car or a tool car. It was still one of the last cars of its kind, which is interesting on its own. 8. The Mary Celeste On December 5, 1872, Crew members aboard the British de Gracia spotted a ship alone adrift in the Chobby Sea, about 400 miles 644 kilometers east of the Azores. The ship's captain, David Morehouse, realized that the unguided ship was the Mary Celeste, which should have arrived at Genoa, Italy, eight days before him. He couldn't leave it behind, so Morehouse changed course and offered his help. When they boarded the ship, they made an eerie discovery. Below deck, the ship's maps and charts had been tossed overboard and the personal belongings of the crew were still in their quarters. The only lifeboat the ship had was missing, and one of its two pumps had been disassembled. Over three feet, one meter of water was sloshing at the bottom of the boat. There were over 1,000 barrels of alcohol, and a six-month supply of food and water was still there, but not a single crew member was there. The Mary Celeste began its voyage on November 7, 1872. On board was Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs, accompanied by his wife and their two-year-old daughter, along with seven crewmen. The 282-ton ship suffered vigorous battles with heavy weather while on their journey to the Azores, which is where they were last logged to be on November 25th. There are many theories about what happened to the crew and why the ship was abandoned. They range from killer water spouts to mutiny, and some even suggested killer sea monsters. To this day, no one knows for sure what happened. The crewmen of the De Gracia traveled to a British court which was holding a salvage hearing which determined whether or not the salvages were entitled to payment from Mary Celeste's insurance. The Attorney General and authorities weren't entirely convinced that the crewmen of the de Gratia were innocent, and that sent them into a drawn-out court investigation. Eventually, they were cleared of any guilt and were awarded their payment. But unfortunately for them, it wasn't much, since only one-sixth of the ship was insured. 7. Red Army Tank Workers discovered an abandoned Red Army tank in a swamp in the town of Seno, Belarus. The tank, which dates back to 1941, is called a KV-1, or Clement Voroshilov-1, named after a Soviet Union marshal. When the Germans invaded in 1941, the KV-1 was the Soviet military's standard heavy tank. It was effective against most German anti-tank weapons, with the credit given to its heavy armored plate and its mounted 75mm gun. Salvage crews worked together to recover the tank after it sat in a swamp for 70 years. During the process, it was seen that the tank turret was upside down and separated from the chassis, which was a sign that the vehicle was riddled with electrical charges. It's unknown whether the tank was destroyed intentionally before it ended up in the mud, or if the damage happened after the tank got stuck. There were also signs of possible fire damage to the chassis. The tank may have been used in the Battle of Seno during World War II, which was a conflict that involved around 2,250 tanks. 6. The Trolley Graveyard 
The Winderberg Trolley Graveyard is fittingly located at the dead end of 19th Street in Winber, Pennsylvania, and it's not actually abandoned. The train car cemetery rests behind log gates on private property. Visitors can only legally tour the area with permission of the property owner. However, given the close proximity to the local high school and the sprawling nature of the property, it isn't surprising that people manage to sneak in. Graffiti covers many of the trolley cars. The official name for the trolley graveyard is the Vintage Electric Streetcar Company, and a lot of love and hard work has been put into it by its owner, Ed Medka. Ed takes his work very seriously. He began his trolley collection in 1992, collecting nearly 50 trolley cars in various states of repair in hopes of restoring and saving them from becoming scrap metal. If you were to tour the property, you'd find all sorts of interesting and different train cars. Some are hidden away to be safe from vandalism and weather, and there's even one that still has power. A few have decayed so badly from being heavily exposed to the elements that they've rusted all the way down to the frame. It's been reported that it's easier to walk through the trolleys rather than around them to avoid tall weeds. Of course, you must be careful to avoid stepping on any scrap metal, debris, or broken glass. Although it wasn't intended to become a graveyard, it seems to be the direction it's heading. Who knows, though? Restoration could be in the graveyard's future. If you're a fan of old vehicles and post-apocalyptic scenery, you should consider going to the Vintage Electric Streetcar Company for a visit. Let us know in the comments if you'd like to go, and hit the subscribe button while you're at it. 5. USS Bear the USS Bear was one of the Coast Guard's most famous ships. It was a forerunner to modern icebreakers, with a long career in the Arctic and North Atlantic seas, and even served in Antarctica for a short period. Built in 1874, the USS Bear was meant to solely be a sealing vessel. Its military service began in 1884, when the US Navy purchased it and used it for an Arctic rescue mission. After that, the ship worked as a Coast Guard cutter for over 40 years along Alaska's 20,000-mile 32,187-kilometer coastline, searching for seal poachers, illicit traders, and whalers in need of help. It was also used as a floating courthouse, delivered food to hungry civilians, and transported reindeer between Siberia and Alaska. Between 1939 to 1941, the USS Bear served in the U.S. Antarctic Service Expedition, and in World War II, the ship patrolled the waters off Greenland making it the oldest Navy ship to be deployed outside the continental US. It was one of the last ships with sails to be used in war. The ship was retired from service in 1948. Philadelphia businessman Alfred Johnston bought it in 1963 with plans to turn it into a floating restaurant, but the vessel ran aground and unfortunately sank 260 miles, 418 kilometers east of Boston, while it was on the way to its new home from California. The Coast Guard rediscovered the wreck in 2019, but only recently confirmed that it's the USS Bear. It's not known if there are further plans to explore it. 4. Orient Express Train A few years ago, a photographer and urban explorer by the name of Brian Romain captured chilling photographs of what looked like an abandoned Orient Express train located in Belgium. The train, which operated as a luxury service for a little over 50 years ago, is just a small shadow of what it used to be. It's rusty on both the inside and outside, and has ripped seats and dusty windows. Ever since it was taken out of service, the train has sat in the train yard and remains there even to this day. Romain discovered it while out and about, exploring the area. The Orient Express luxury travel brand was originally called the Express d'Orient, and it operated for 133 years, from 1883 to 2009. It was rebranded as the Orient Express in 1891. The final train ride under the Orient Express name was in 2009, between Strasbourg, France, and Vienna, Austria. The abandoned and decaying Type 620 train, which was once the heart of Belgium's national railway, is the last of its kind. While it turns out that it may not have been an Orient Express train after all, as those routes never actually passed through Belgium. And while the abandoned train might not be an Orient Express, it is an impressive reminder of a past era. 3. Old Car City A 32-acre property located in White, Georgia, is home to one of the world's largest car junkyards. It's known as Old Car City and is filled with abandoned vintage cars covered in nature's overgrowth. The Lewis family has owned the site since 1931. It first consisted of a general store, and later on it became a used car parts dealership. As time passed, the land became aggressively overrun with cars and parts, with roughly 4,000 vehicles, most of them dating back between the 1950s and the 1980s. It's not just cars. 
There's also trucks and even some school buses. As the cars met their rust limit, plant life became a large part of the huge collection of junk. The vehicles have sat frozen in time for decades. One of the most popular displays at the site is the two-ton flower pot, which is a 1939 Chevy with branches coming through its busted-out windshield from the inside. The original owner's son, Dean Lewis, saw a special opportunity with the car collection. He turned the property into an attraction for photographers and welcomes professionals and enthusiasts to come and explore. Lewis created trails and put up signs for visitors to follow. Thousands of people have come from all over to see the scrapyard for themselves. 2. World War II Graveyard in the middle of a small dark forest near Châtillon, a little village in southern Belgium, is a graveyard of abandoned rusty cars. Around 500 vehicles were abandoned at the end of World War II. When the war was over, soldiers were unable to take their cars back with them to the US due to high shipping costs. They all had the option of retrieving their vehicles, but none were spoken for. So, they were driven one by one up a hill and parked neatly in a row in the forest. Locals and car collectors stole car parts when they caught wind of this eerie graveyard, and the rest was simply left for Mother Nature. In the beginning, there were four graveyards in the area, but very little remains today. While the army story seems to be the most popular explanation, certain things don't make sense about it. For one, it seems pretty shocking that if the vehicles were indeed left behind by soldiers, not even one of them regretted or cared about leaving their vehicle behind or coming back to get it. And many locals like to point out that a lot of the cars were from after World War II and indicated that the site may have just been an average junkyard. 1. The Cavern of Lost Souls Located in the small village of Corris Uchaf in North Wales, there's a hole in the mountains that's become a dumping ground of sorts for old vehicles and other junk that people no longer want. The cave was originally a slate mine that operated for nearly a hundred years before closing in 1906 due to the lack of slate demand. The mine was revived and continued its operation sporadically following World War I, until finally closing its doors for good in 1971. Afterward, it became a dumping ground for mostly unwanted vehicles. Old TVs, radios, and various appliances can be found in the mine as well. The mine was nicknamed the Cavern of Lost Souls. Allegedly, the landfill is completely safe, but you can't really tell from looking at it. When urban explorers discovered the mine just a few years ago, and posted photos of the tangled mess of metals from hundreds of cars, the mysterious mine started to circulate more online. It's gotten the attention of cave explorers and photographers all over the world. 11. The Colbert Built during the 1950s, the Colbert was an anti-aircraft ship that was converted into a missile cruiser in 1970. She was the sixth ship and the second cruiser of the French Navy to be named after Jean-Baptiste Colbert. He was a French statesman who served as first minister of state from 1661 until his death in 1683 under the rule of King Louis XIV. The previous ship was scuttled at Toulon in 1942. It served the French Navy until 1991. As a vessel that served mainly in the Cold War era, she only saw combat once at the very end of her career during the Gulf War. From 1993 until 2007, the Colbert operated as a museum and a national heritage site. Guided tours enabled members of the public to see parts of the ship that were normally off-limits, including its cabins and engine room. But the museum struggled with a chronic lack of funding and couldn't keep up with the maintenance and security costs, and in 2006, it closed for good. In May 2007, the Colbert was towed to the abandoned ship fleet in Landevenek. She was stripped for parts, mostly from the boilers and turbines, to sustain the helicopter carrier Jean d'Arc. The ship became surplus when Jean d'Arc was decommissioned in September 2010. On June 15, 2016, the Colbert was towed to Bassin, River Gironde, to be used for scraps. 10. North Truro Air Force Station from 1951 to 1994, the U.S. Air Force operated a general surveillance radar station just outside North Truro, Massachusetts. During that time, it boasted a staff of over 500 military and civilian personnel who supported the base's mission to detect, identify, intercept, and destroy hostile aircraft. Operations began during an era of fear about the Soviet Union's development of the nuclear bomb. 
The base function as both an air defense station and a support base for radar towers 110 miles 877 kilometers off the Cape Cod coast. In 1994, the Air Force officially ceased operations at North Truro, leaving behind barracks and family housing, a bar, a library, a bowling alley, a chapel, and other buildings. Most of the property was handed over to the National Park Service, which renovated and repurposed some of the structures, demolished others, and allowed some to fall into disrepair. 9. The Diefen Bunker Built between 1959 and 1961 in Ottawa, Ontario, the Diefen Bunker is a four-story underground shelter that was meant to house top-ranking Canadian government and military officials in the event of nuclear war. It was commissioned by then-Prime Minister John Diefenbaker amid escalating Cold War tensions and was designed to sustain 535 inhabitants for 30 days while enabling them to continue running the country. The Diefen Bunker was built in secret on a former farm under the codename Project Emergency Army Signals Establishment Ease. It's located in a valley relatively close to downtown Ottawa and was ideal for the need to retreat to a safe place on short notice. Construction on the 100,000 square foot, 9,290 meter squared shelter took less than 18 months from start to finish. It was used from 1961 until 1994, during which time it functioned as a Canadian Forces station that operated 24 hours a day and had between 100 and 150 staff members. During the Cold War years, the Diefen Bunker facilitated some of Canada's most top secret communications. Today, visitors can see the massive facilities firsthand, including the war room, the prime minister's bedroom, other staff bedrooms, washrooms, offices, machine rooms, kitchen, cafeteria, exercise and activity areas, and more. 8. Arousk 7 The Aral Sea was once the world's fourth largest lake but it began shrinking during the 1960s because of Soviet irrigation projects that diverted the rivers that fed into it. By 2010, the sea had all but disappeared. All that's left of it today are a few small lakes. The territory that once made up Vosros Denaya Island, a 77-square-mile, 200-kilometer-square island that sat in the Aral Sea before it dried up, is split today between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. It's the former site of a top-secret Soviet biological weapons testing site that was built in 1948 and expanded in 1954. Known as Arosk 7, the facility tested many dangerous bioweapons, including anthrax, smallpox, plague, brucellosis, and tularemia. The site was designed to test the effects of deadly diseases. Not surprisingly, Arrows 7 was a dangerous place, but you didn't need to go there to be exposed to its hazards. In 1971, an accidental release of weaponized smallpox infected 10 people, killing three of them. A mass vaccination ensued, and around 50,000 nearby residents were inoculated, but the incident was kept largely hidden from the general public until 2002. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991, Arosk 7 was closed and its 1,500 residents were evacuated in the following weeks. Today, the site is littered with the remains of the island's abandoned structures. Because many of the dangerous biological weapons that were created and tested there weren't stored or destroyed properly, several of the containers holding them have sprung leaks. This makes it extremely dangerous for anyone to go there. 10. Anthrax burial sites have been decontaminated so far as part of an ongoing effort to clean up the area. 7. Drake Low Tunnels Built beneath Kingston Country Park in Worcestershire, England during the early 1940s, an underground complex comprising 3.5 miles, 5.6 kilometers of tunnels, originally functioned as a shadow factory for the Rover Car Company, a place where aircraft engine parts were produced. Known as the Drake Low Tunnels, their manufacturing use continued throughout the 1950s, during which time the site became a production facility for tank engines as well. In 1961, half the tunnels were converted into a top-secret headquarters where the UK government could continue to function during a nuclear war. It was one of 13 underground sites of its kind that were created around that time for the same purpose. The Drake Low Tunnels and Bunker were kept secret from the public until they were decommissioned in 1993. In the years since then, the Drake Low Tunnels Preservation Trust has been working to restore and preserve the site, hoping to reopen it as a Cold War museum. Some sections are open to visitors, but there are areas that would need extensive work and probably wouldn't be accessible to the public for some time. 6. Albanian Bunkers Cold War-era bunkers are a common sight in Albania. That's because thousands of them were built between 1968 and 1983 under the radical communist leader Enver Hoxar, who was convinced that an attack was imminent. Hoxar was extreme in his ways. To give you an idea, he believed that Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong were both too soft. 
Fearing an invasion from both the West and the Soviet Union, he adhered to an isolationist policy. The paranoid leader wanted a bunker built for every four of the country's residents. Although he never achieved this goal, over 173,000 concrete bunkers were built during his 20-year rule. The dome-shaped structures were manufactured at a factory and delivered by truck. Albania's resources were already scarce when Hoxar embarked on his so-called bunkerization project. The massive endeavor stretched the country's resources to their limit, and they were never even used for their intended purpose. Nobody had a reason to use them until the Kosovo War and the Albanian Civil War during the 1990s, and even then their use was limited. A few of the bunkers have been removed, but many still dot the landscape today. Some have been converted into hostels, homes, and museums, while the rest are simply rotting in place. What do you think the rest of the abandoned bunkers could be used for? Let me know in the comments, and be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. 5. Thinker's Lodge Before he became a highly successful investor in the American Midwest, Cyrus Eaton lived in the tiny Canadian fishing village of Pugwash in Nova Scotia. Besides becoming a wealthy entrepreneur, he was known for being generous and philanthropic. In keeping with these values, in the 1950s, Eaton offered his old home in Pugwash as a meeting place for scientists and intellectuals who wanted to ease Cold War tensions and brainstorm ways to achieve nuclear disarmament. The first meeting included Eaton himself and representatives from many countries, including the United States, the Soviet Union, Japan, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Austria, China, France, and Poland. They founded an organization called the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. It won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995 and influenced several Cold War-related agreements, including the Partial Test Ban Treaty in 1963, the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1972, and the Biological Weapons Convention that same year. Eaton's house, also known as the Thinker's Lodge, remains in place today and is preserved as a museum dedicated to the minds who came together there during one of the most nerve-wracking periods in recent history. 4. Balaclava Submarine Base The USSR constructed a facility known as Object 825 on the Crimean Peninsula in the small oceanside town of Balaclava, which has functioned as a Russian military port for centuries. Built underground as a naval installation in 1957, the Cold War era base was invisible from the open sea, affording it ample protection from prying enemies. It took four years to complete the structure. Builders blasted away rock to create a 2,000-foot-long, 610-meter tunnel that connects different sections of the interior. Object 825 was designed to both withstand an American nuclear attack and to respond to it effectively. It also served as a repair center for the Soviet Black Sea Fleet of submarines. The site was stocked with enough food, water, and other provisions for its 1,500-person staff to survive for a month in the event of a nuclear strike. For maximum security, an enormous set of doors and a concrete reinforced gate blocked each section of the base. Object 825 closed down in 1993 after the Soviet Union fell. In 2000, it fell into the hands of the Ukrainian Navy. By then, the site had been significantly looted and damaged, with all its metal having been removed for scrap. It became a museum in 2003. Russia seized the Crimean Peninsula in 2014 and is reportedly considering the possibility of restoring the submarine base for military use. 3. Hat Green Secret Nuclear Bunker Even during the later stages of the Cold War, governments were building and operating new secret bunkers. Included among them was the Hat Green Secret Bunker in Cheshire, England, which went operational in 1984. Unlike many other bunkers, its use continued after the Cold War ended until 1998, when it was converted into a museum. The property's use began during World War II, when it functioned as a fake-out site that was meant to confuse the Luftwaffe into thinking it was a vital rail station. During the 1950s, a concrete bunker was built and used for controlling military airspace. It was eventually abandoned and sat unused for several years before it became a Cold War nuclear bunker. After re-entering use in 1984, it functioned as part of a system of 17 sites across the UK that would enable the government to continue operating during and after a nuclear attack. Today, it houses one of the world's largest collections of decommissioned nuclear weapons, along with an array of Cold War and military memorabilia. Visitors can see how the bunker operated back when it was in use, and can even experience what it would have been like during a nuclear attack using a simulator. 2. USS Albacore Back when it was built during the early 1950s, the USS Albacore was one of the world's fastest and most sophisticated submarines. The 200-foot, 61-meter sub functioned primarily as a research vessel during the two decades it operated during the Cold War. 
It pioneered the design for the American version of the teardrop hull, which was built with underwater speed and maneuverability in mind. The US Navy never revealed how fast the Albacore could go, but admitted that the submarine reached the same maximum speed as its predecessor, while using half the horsepower. They kept the vast majority of its operations classified, and revealed limited findings and details to the public. The Albacore was decommissioned in 1972 because of repeated diesel engine failures. She was returned to where she was built, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and remains there to this day. Today, the sub is a museum that sits on dry land. Visitors have full access to the interior and can learn about the parts of its history that the military is willing to disclose. 1. Buckner Building On the western edge of Prince William Sound in Whittier, Alaska, the Composite Bachelor Housing Service and Recreation Center, also known as the Buckner Building, was completed in 1953. It was used to accommodate the Cold War era housing and recreational needs of 1,000 American soldiers. Once nicknamed the City Under One Roof, the six-story, 275,000-square-foot, 25,548-square-meter structure measured roughly 500 feet, 852.4 meters long, by 50 to 150 feet, 15.24 to 45.72 meters wide, making it one of Alaska's tallest buildings for some time. Built by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, it contained a mess hall, sleeping quarters, movie theater, bowling alley, small jail, and tunnels collecting it to other parts of Whittier. The Buckner Building was strategically located near an all-weather railroad port and deep-water ocean terminal that stayed ice-free year-round, enabling the base to play a crucial role in supplying anchorage with military necessities. The site's near-constant cloud cover protected it from potential airstrikes. A destructive earthquake struck Whittier in 1964, inflicting some $5 million in damages to the town and killing 13 people. Because of the Buckner Building's helpful directional alignment, which runs at an angle to seismic motion, and because its foundation sits on bedrock, it suffered no structural damage. The military pulled out of Whittier two years later in 1966, and the building subsequently changed hands several times. At one point, there were plans to turn the site into a state prison, but this vision failed to pan out. The Buckner Building fell into disrepair under the ownership of the citizens of the new city of Whittier, and has since remained in a cycle of freezing and thawing with the missing and broken windows and doors welcoming the elements inside with open arms. It went into foreclosure in 2016, but the site's future remains undetermined as local and state authorities grapple over what to do with it. To preserve history, the city would like to see the Buckner Building saved, but the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation has recommended the structure for demolition. Number 10. Bristol at Beaver Lodge Lake Dietmar Eckel is a German photographer who left his marketing job in 2014 to track down what he calls miracles in aviation history, abandoned planes that were forced down with no deaths. His search through old newspapers and other records led him all over the world, including to the remote Canadian wilderness, where he photographed a Bristol Type 170 freighter cargo plane that crashed in 1956. The aircraft had touched down on the frozen water at Beaver Lodge Lake in Saskatchewan when some of the landing gear broke through the ice, causing the left wing to hit the ground and bend. All three crew members were rescued and the plane was left sitting on the lakeside after they decided it was too damaged to repair. After learning about the plane, Eckel persuaded a retired pilot to fly him over the site. The pilot spent his 30-year career flying in the region and had never heard about the abandoned Bristol, leaving him skeptical that it would actually be there. But it was, and it appeared to be in remarkable condition for having sat neglected for nearly 60 years. Number 9. SS St. Christopher Originally named the HMS Justice, the SS St. Christopher was a 165-foot-long rescue tug that was built for the U.S. Navy in 1943 during World War II. But the Americans never used the wooden vessel. Instead, the British Royal Navy borrowed it under the Lend-Lease Act, which provides U.S. allies with food, oil, and military equipment. The St. Christopher was used during the Allied invasion of Normandy, better known as D-Day, on June 6, 1944. It was returned to the U.S. Navy after the war ended and was then sold to a private buyer. During the 1950s, the boat ran aground and encountered engine and rudder problems. It was grounded at Beagle Channel in Ushuaia at the southern tip of Argentina. Nicknamed the end of the world, it's famous as the world's southernmost city. Today, the St. Christopher lies partially submerged in precisely the exact spot where it was abandoned almost 65 years ago. It has since become a tourist attraction and is lit up at night, but nobody's allowed to board the heavily damaged vessel, which looks as if it might finish sinking into the ocean at any moment. 
Number 8. Curtis C-46 Commando World War II had just entered its final year in 1945 when a C-45 transport plane vanished in the Himalayan mountains with 13 passengers aboard. It was en route from Kunming in southern China when it disappeared in a storm over the state of Arunachal Pradesh in northeastern India. The plane was never seen or heard from again until recently after one of the passengers' surviving sons reached out to American explorer Clayton Cools and asked him to search for it. Working with a team of indigenous guides from the local Lisu ethnic group, Cools embarked on a month-long expedition to find the downed aircraft. It was no easy feat. The group crossed chest-deep rivers, climbed up to high altitudes, and camped in freezing weather. Even the experienced guides were uneasy about the trek, according to Cools, who told Al Jazeera that three Lisu hunters had died of hypothermia in the same area in 2018. So it was probably a tremendous relief when the group finally found the aircraft on a mountaintop and identified it based on its tail. But unfortunately, there were no human remains at the wreck site, which represents just one of the hundreds of military planes that went missing in India, China, and Myanmar during World War II. Most are believed to have crashed because of severe weather conditions like ice damage and hurricane force wind, according to Cools, who said that only some aircraft losses were at the hands of the Japanese. Number 7. Bell Amica Members of the Italian Coast Guard were perplexed in August 2006 when they spotted a schooner called the Bell Amica drifting aimlessly off the Sardinian coast in the Mediterranean Sea. The vessel was found near Punta Volpe and appeared to be abandoned. Its discoverers boarded it and steered it away from some rocks and shallow waters that it was headed toward. Inside the Bell Amica, they found French maps of North African bodies of water, partially eaten Egyptian meals, a pile of clothing, and the Luxembourg flag. Investigators soon discovered that the boat was never registered in any country, including Italy. They also realized that the Bell Amica was not the antique vessel they had first suspected. Instead, it was a modern boat owned by a man from Luxembourg named Franck Ruyaru. He had anchored it in deep waters and deserted it, later claiming that he'd left to deal with a family emergency and planned to return to the yacht as soon as he'd taken care of things back home. But the story didn't quite add up for detectives or the Italian press, suggesting that Ruyaru abandoned the Bell Amica to avoid paying taxes. Unfortunately, nobody seems to know the actual story to this day, and if they do, they're staying quiet about it. Number 6. Lockheed P-38 Lightning On July 8, 1944, a P-38 fighter aircraft crashed in the forest near Waldeg, Austria, while being flown by 2nd Lieutenant Henry Donald Mitchell. The 23-year-old American pilot and his plane were never seen again, leaving his brother Bob Mitchell wondering his entire life about precisely what happened that day. The crash site was discovered in 2017 on privately owned land. Unfortunately, authorities ran into complications with the landowner getting permission to excavate, putting the investigation on hold. American and Austrian diplomats worked together to resolve the issues. Still, it wasn't until the property owner passed away that they gained access to the site through the man's son, who was more open-minded to the idea. Last year, the U.S. Department of POW MIA Accounting Agency finally got a chance to investigate the site. They confirmed the plane's identity and found human remains, which they believed belonged to Donald Mitchell. The agency sent Bob an email to inform him of the discovery while they waited for the bones to be identified. A forensic anthropologist confirmed the remains belonged to Donald Mitchell, ending Bob's decades-long search, which began in 1997. He didn't believe that Donald went down with the plane for a long time, especially since his fellow soldiers didn't see the crash. It left Bob wondering if Donald had somehow survived and had perhaps been taken as a prisoner of war. Now that his brother's remains have been found, he no longer has to wonder and has received long-awaited closure. How long would you search if a member of your family vanished? Let us know in the comments and remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Number 5. Dimitrios there's a rusting cargo ship sitting along a remote shoreline a few miles from the Greek town of Githio. Known as the Demetrios, the 220-foot-long vessel was built in Denmark in 1950. There are conflicting stories about how it ended up abandoned on the beach at Valtaki. According to one rumor, the ship was used for smuggling cigarettes between Turkey and Italy. Authorities seized it at Githio and supposedly released it from the port on purpose, treating it as if it wasn't their problem. But then, someone set it on fire to hide evidence of its involvement in illicit trade. A more vague story describes the Demetrios as a ghost ship of unknown origin. A book written by the former honorary chief of the Hellenic Coast Guard, Vice Admiral Christos Intunis, claims the ship made an emergency docking in 1980 because the captain had a severe illness that he needed treatment for. Several things went wrong after that. The ship started having engine problems and the crew ran into financial and insurance issues. Then they were all fired. Over the next several months, the Demetrios continued to deteriorate. 
Water got into the hole, causing it to list. The ship was declared dangerous, and port authorities asked the owners to move it. They didn't respond for months, and lousy weather stranded the vessel at its current site. There were no attempts to salvage it. Number 4. Folsom Lake Wreck Nestled in the Sierra Nevada foothills outside Sacramento, Folsom Lake is a man-made reservoir that was created in 1955 to control the waters of the American River. There are no homes around the lake or in the surrounding wilderness, which are designated recreation areas managed by California's Parks and Recreation Department. On New Year's Day in 1965, a small plane crashed into Folsom Lake, killing all four people aboard. Last year, ABC News told the heartbreaking story of a man who lost his brother, 15-year-old Glenn Amick, in the accident. Glenn was out sightseeing in the plane when his life was unexpectedly cut short. His brother, Frank Wilcox, was only three years old at the time, but he spent much of his life longing for closure and searching for clues about Glenn's fate. Unfortunately, Wilcox passed away without ever finding the answers he was looking for. Last year, a pair of researchers named Jeff Riley and Tyler Atkinson found what they believe may be the wrecked plane while testing new underwater sonar technology in Folsom Lake. The equipment detected something artificial in the deepest part of the lake, but the water was too murky to tell what it was. Riley and Atkinson returned to the site with a remotely operated vehicle and sent it 160 feet to the lake bed to investigate. Unfortunately, the water was still too cloudy to see much. On their third visit, the two men attached a sonar device to the ROV and finally got images of what they were trying to see. It was a fully intact, silt-covered plane. Several of its parts were visible, but the explorers couldn't see inside the cockpit or make out its identification number. They credited the lake's shallow water levels with helping them discover the long-missing aircraft. Speaking with local station KGO-TV, Riley said that he found it rewarding to know that he may be able to give a family some long-awaited closure. Number 3. Edward Bolin There's a 500-mile stretch of remote coastline in northern Namibia known for having some of the harshest and most unforgiving conditions on the planet. As a result, death is ever-present. It's littered with animal remains and dozens of decaying shipwrecks that lost their battles against the elements, which is why it's called the Skeleton Coast. Over the last several hundred years, over 500 ships have wrecked in thick fog, rough seas, unpredictable currents, and heavy winds. Sailors who survived and reached land often died of thirst in the scorching desert heat. One of the most famous shipwrecks along the Skeleton Coast is the Edward Bolin a 310-foot-long cargo ship that became trapped in fog and ran aground in 1909. The desert encroached upon the shoreline over the following years, leaving the ship partially buried in the sand. Today, it sits over a thousand feet away from the water near two other wrecks, the Otavi and the MV Dunedin Star. The MV Dunedin Star was a cargo ship that ran aground in 1942, and the Otavi foundered and sank in 1945. Some of the vessels along the Skeleton Coast are much older, dating as far back as the 16th century. The scattered wrecks are a sobering reminder of how disaster and death define the region. Number 2. PZL TS-11 Iskra The small village of Volka Nosowska in eastern Poland is home to just 400 residents. It drew the attention of thousands of internet users in 2019 when an overhead image of an abandoned plane surrounded by trees began circulating online. The photo first appeared on an Instagram page belonging to a photographer from North Wales named Tom Dolman. Journalist Christoph Basil tracked Dolman down to ask him about what drew him to a tiny village in the middle of nowhere to take snapshots of an aircraft hidden in a grove of trees. Basil was skeptical of the picture's authenticity, believing that perhaps Dolman had photographed the grove and slammed the airplane into it. Dolman confirmed the photo was in fact genuine. He provided the map coordinates of its location to Basil to prove it. A closer look revealed that the jet is situated next to a house, leading the writer to speculate that perhaps it belongs to the homeowners. The jet is a Polish jet trainer called the PZL TS-11 Iskra. Designed during the early 1960s, it was the first domestically developed Polish jet aircraft. Exactly 424 were built between 1963 and 1987. The PZL TS-11 Iskra was used by the Polish and Indian Air Forces, serving as the principal training aircraft for the Polish Air Force for over 50 years. Dolman told Basil that he first spotted the plane while traveling the Polish countryside with a group of friends. He noticed its wings sticking out of the grove and made plans to return to the site when the weather was more favorable. After taking several aerial snapshots, the photographer returned to Britain and perfected his favorite shot before posting it on his Instagram. Although Dolman never expected the photo to go viral, he was worried that his friends might even think it was boring. But the intriguing image quickly racked up thousands of likes among friends and strangers alike. Number 1. Vickers Plane 
The first aircraft to visit Antarctica was a single-propeller Vickers plane that Australian explorer Douglas Mawson used in his expedition of the continent during the early 20th century. He abandoned the aircraft on an ice shore at Cape Denison in 1911 after its engine seized up during a demonstration flight. Until relatively recently, the last time anyone spotted the aircraft was back in 1975 during an unusually low tide. Then, a team of Australian explorers rediscovered it on New Year's Day in 2010 after a painstaking three-year search. While walking along the shore of Commonwealth Bay, team member Mark Farrell noticed metal along the rocks in just a few inches of water. It was the plane's fuselage. The team had an ultra-low tide, courtesy of a blue moon, as well as melting ice to thank for the aircraft's unexpected appearance. Team leader David Jensen said that the conditions gave them the one in a million chance that they needed to spot the plane. Thanks for watching. Which one of these abandoned vehicles would you most like to own? Let us know in the comments and be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to catch more amazing videos like this one right here on American Eye.